With that in mind, I'm delighted today to introduce some young people who are already making the world better. They represent a new generation of daring dreamers who will help drive the next 20 years of biotech breakthroughs. A few months ago, Forbes magazine published its annual 30 Under 30 feature, profiling young disruptors, innovators, and entrepreneurs in science and healthcare. And four of these very inspiring young leaders are here today. So let's meet them. Laura Deming. From age eight, Laura wanted to work on curing the diseases of aging. Since then, age has taken its toll on her. She's now 18. She's a member of the prestigious Theo Fellowship and a partner at the Longevity Fund. Welcome, Laura, please. Next, we have Isaac Kinde. He's the old man of the group. He's 29. And he's an MD, PhD candidate at John Hopkins School of Medicine, where he's researching DNA sequencing technology for early detection of cancer. Isaac. <laughs> Adina Mengutbat. Adina is 26, already chief executive of Spiral Genetics. Her company helps biologists manage the high volume of data generated by DNA sequencing. Adina. And finally, Joshua Summer. Joshua is 25, he's the executive director of the Cordoma Foundation, which he founded to start and fund research for treating the rare and deadly bone cancer that struck him six years ago. Joshua. Okay, welcome all, thank you for being with us. Um, I'm gonna start with Adina. Uh, you co-founded your company, Spiral Genetics, in 2009 after winning a business plan competition a few weeks, and a few weeks ago, Spiral closed a $3 million venture round. Congratulations, by the way, Thanks. for that. Pretty impressive. Tell us, how close is the company that you're leading today to the company you envisioned in the original business plan? Honestly, not at all. Um, the original idea was something much closer to 23andMe. Um, but basically, we, we looked at that market and we weren't sure that it was going to be large enough. And then also, competitors like 23andMe were coming well into funded. play. Well funded. Well funded. Yeah. Um, you know, pro tip, don't go head to head with you know, someone who's incredibly funded if you're two ladies in a garage. Um, and so we did a ton of pivoting. Um, that's the technical term for choosing new ideas after the first one doesn't work out. Um, and we found our third co-founder, and it was kind of one of those perfect storm moments where the right people were in the right room at the right time, um, and that was the really true birth of what is now Spiral Genetics and the current idea we're working on. So give everyone a, a flavor of exactly what the company does, and particularly how it's going to impact personalized medicine and, and what you told me about how it can transform clinical trials and make them smaller and, and less costly. Yeah, um, so basically, in a nutshell, what we do is we make high-performance bioinformatics software um, for next-generation sequencing analysis. And we specialize in really large-scale data analysis, so we do it basically faster and more scalably than anybody else does right now. Um, and where we're going with that technology is there's a lot of buzz around big data right now in a lot of other industries, but that can really be applied here in genetics as well. Um, so ultimately what we're driving toward is a world where everyone has their genome sequenced, it's part of your medical record, and all drugs are developed for specific genetic populations, um, making them safer and more effective than what we have on the market today. Um, so I mean, we're definitely driving toward that. Um, the next iteration of our software is actually going to be targeting um, specifically pharmacogenomics um, issues. And we're 
basically building a large scale comparative genomics engine to allow um, people that are in the middle of clinical trials that may be having problems with e efficacy um, to be able to basically help them select which patients will respond and which patients won't. Um, so we're actually looking for a big data partner on that. So if you've got any uh, large scale clinical trials that are happening right now and you want to sequence like 300 whole human genomes, call me. <laughs> been partnering in the partnering session already today? We have. Um, so we'll be meeting with a number of you uh, the next couple of days. But if we didn't, for some reason, uh, send you an email, uh, you can send me one. <laughs> All right. Isaac, you're up. You're an MD, as I said, an MD, PhD candidate at John Hopkins. You're researching DNA sequencing technology that you hope will enable earlier detection of colon cancer and other cancers. So what got you into this? What uh, inspired you to, to go to medical school for the first place and attracted you to this particular area of research? So, you know, I can think back, you know, over the course of my life, uh, you know, for, like, there's many different things that, you know, got me interested in the field. But if I can single out one particular experience, it was when I was in fifth grade and I had a horrible case of food poisoning and I had, I guess, a very strange father. And his instinct was to take a stool sample from me. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Your, your father just wasn't any guy taking it. He, he, he was in veterinary medicine, academic yes. veterinary medicine. Yes, my dad was. So he knew, he knew a little bit about what he was doing. Exactly. He, he knew what he was doing. Um, he's, he's an academic veterinary pathologist. And he studies, uh, you know, the diseases that affect um, livestock, you know, among other things. So he took a stool sample from me and went to the lab and figured out um, that I had salmonella poisoning. And, you know, he took me to the hospital and the clinicians just looked dumbfounded that, you know, my father would do that. Um, so I had a very special father, but, you know, at, and still do. And, you know, if I, when I look back at that experience, it really, I, I thought it was really cool that, you know, I had a disease that I didn't understand what was going on and that there were diagnostic tests available to evaluate and, you know, inform me, you know, as to what was going on. So now fast forward, you know, almost 15 years later, and I am looking for a research project to pursue in the lab. And a couple of my mentors were kind of throwing out ideas uh, about you know, what I would start on as an initial project. And they asked me, you know, how would you feel about uh, you know, diagnosing colon cancer? Uh, I have to warn you, you may have to work with stool samples. And I said, I think I, think I got that covered. I'll, I'll, be glad, I'll be glad to take on that challenge. The Lord moves in mysterious ways. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. And so tell me, what, what, what are you hoping to, to accomplish with the research you're doing now? Well, what's, what we know is that it's much, much easier to treat a cancer at an early stage versus a later stage. And if you can catch a cancer at the earliest stages, like stage one or stage two, you, you know, sometimes can have upwards of a 90% uh, cure rate. And the problem is that it's difficult to know when these cancers are developing. So what we want to be able to do is develop a tool that's non-invasive, that's uh, something that a patient would want to succumb themselves to, uh, you know, something that's not that uncomfortable, and with a high degree of precision, say whether or not you have a cancer. And, you know, once you get to the symptoms of a cancer, that's, that's a, a lot of times too late. So we want to be able to look at a healthy population, detect cancers earlier, and uh, hopefully reduce the, incidence, uh, reduce the incidence of cancer and reduce its mortality. So Joshua, you're, you were 22. You're a student at Duke University. You start getting these horrific headaches. One lasts like two weeks. I finally, I think you get an MRI or something, and you discover you have this rare tumor, chordoma, in the center of your brain. 
uh, you uh, will take the story from there. That's exactly right, Jim. Um, so after getting the diagnosis of this tumor in my head uh, and having surgery to remove it, got the diagnosis of chordoma, which is this very rare form of bone cancer. And my first instinct was really to try to wrap my head around the problem and understand what was facing me. I mean, um, wrap your head around it is kind of a euphemistically analogy. Yeah. <laughs> it was already wrapped around the tumor, actually. It's already wrapped around. Um, but what I learned was actually quite uh, discouraging. The average survival was about seven years. There was a cure rate of about 20 or 30 percent. Uh, no approved drugs, and it didn't seem like there was much hope of improving those odds because there was very little research being done. Uh, but it turned out that the only federally funded chordoma researcher in the country actually happened to be an oncologist uh, at Duke where I was studying. And um, so uh, wanting to do something to try to make a difference for this disease, I, I went to him and offered uh, to help in any way I could. And uh, he fortunately had a spot for me in his lab, and I was completely unqualified, didn't know the first thing about uh, medicine or molecular biology, but uh, I ended up joining the lab and um, really getting engrossed in the science and starting to make a little bit of progress, but uh, very quickly it became clear that one lab was not going to solve the problem. There was only so much that we could accomplish. We really, if we were serious about having a chance of curing this disease in my lifetime, that it was going to require bringing the expertise of many more labs to bear on this problem, uh, bringing uh, drug companies uh, and pharmaceutical companies uh, to, to bear. Um, but the problem was, for those people that, or institutions that were interested in studying chordoma, there were a number of roadblocks standing in the way. We didn't have cell lines or tissue or animal models to study. Uh, th those of us that were studying it were completely disconnected. There was no communication or coordination. Funding was obviously a challenge. And so that led, in 2007, uh, to start the Cordoma Foundation, really to try to solve those problems and uh, facilitate uh, and accelerate the development of treatments in a, in a systematic and coordinated manner. Now, uh, to do that, the very first step was really to try to create the conditions to make Cordoma research possible, to create those preclinical models, to create a venue for researchers to come together and share information, to raise money, to fund research. But that, is important but not sufficient. We actually take a step further beyond just funding research uh, and waiting for researchers to come to us with ideas or requests for cell lines or animal models. We really take a proactive approach. We've developed a comprehensive research roadmap and systematically initiate, facilitate, and fund research uh, to drive that research roadmap forward. Let's turn to you, Lar. I don't think there are many people in this room or anywhere else who sort of decide what you want to do with your life at the age of eight. Um, but you did. Uh, I think it was, you saw your grandmother uh, suffering from the frailties of, of old age. Uh, and uh, you told me when we talked earlier that you were sort of surprised that everybody seemed to think that, well, death, death is inevitable and this is what happens to you when you get old, you fall apart. And, and you're eight years old and you say, I don't think so. I don't think that has to be the way it goes. And so uh, if I get the story right, by 12 you were working in a biotech lab in California. By 14 you were enrolled at MIT. By 17, you're out of MIT and a Thiel Fellow founding the Longevity Fund. So what have you learned so far? And uh, tell us what you're doing. Awesome. OK. Um, so I think the best way to illustrate why what I want to work on is exciting is to describe to you a discovery in late 2011 uh, by the Mayo Clinic. And what they did was they took an old mouse, a proteroid mouse model, and they removed all the senescent cells in the mouse's body. And the mouse went from being old and hunched over and gray to being young, robust, and fit. And it was as though the aging process had really been reversed at an advanced stage of mouse life. Um, and the extraordinary fact is that there are so many of these types of experiments that are in the lab. And we're doing this in mice. We've been doing it in nematodes for, what, 30 years? Um, with single gene mutations making worms live 10 times longer than normal. Um, and yet, no pharma company exists currently um, that is taking these processes and turning them into therapeutic candidates, with the minor exception of citrus pharmaceuticals. Um, but it, it's really this incredible science that needs a home in the clinic. And so what I worked on for six years was the laboratory part of that. And then I think as Josh realized, seeing the laboratory part of it exist, or perhaps be latent to exist, 
and then not getting translated into the clinic. Um, and so what I was lucky enough to get funding to do and what I spent the past two years building is closed capital in a fund to seed preclinical companies in this space and to give the technology a chance to get to market. Um, and so that is what the Longevity Fund's mission is. So how would you get this into the clinic? I'm trying to imagine recruiting for a clinical trial. I mean, you run ads that say, are you old and don't want to be? I mean, Right, so this is the... What would be the ethics of a clinical trial using these, some of these experimental drugs? So this is actually the misconception about aging, this, this conceit that because the FDA does not view aging as a treatable condition, it's impossible to create therapeutics for it or run clinical trials for it. Um, it's sort of like saying because the FDA does not view having X amount of microbes in, in yourself at any one point in time as something that can be treated, that doesn't mean that the symptoms of the, the disease are a suitable indication for clinical trial. Um, aging is cool because, oh, it's not cool, it's bad, because it underlies almost every time-related disease that we know. You know, Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, all these things increase in prevalence with chronological age. And so if you affect the aging process, and we see this in mouse models, um, you delay the onset of, and in some cases, ameliorate the, the current state of all those diseases, and any one of those can form a clinical trial. And so you have your choice of paths to market. Um, and so you can optimize for market size and ease of clinical trial. And that is one of the reasons that I think aging therapeutics are hugely exciting to start working on right now. Fabulous. So, Adina, I, I remember when you and I spoke, um, you really wanted to talk about mentorship and how much mentoring meant to you. Um, and I'd like each of you to talk a little bit about um, uh, who it was that uh, more, one or more people in your lives that really um, have been mentors to you and, and, uh, and helped you go forward. And, um, and I think maybe make a little bit commercial to all these folks out here about how they can uh, play a similar role with other young people. Yeah. Um, well, for me, my biggest mentor was actually the professor. Um, that was teaching the course that led to Becky, my chief scientist, and I meeting. And that was the whole business plan competition side of things. And it was really in that course that permission was given in many ways to say that, you know, you don't have to just graduate and go and get a job and work your way up the ladder. You can actually go and start something yourself. Um, and you can, you know, in many ways skip a lot of that. Um, and so that was a really, really huge realization for me because especially when you're in school, you don't really know what your options are. And so being shown that there are people out there that are doing this um, was a really, really big um, thing for me. And so I actually spent a lot of my time now um, going back to that same course and um, kind of mentoring the new young entrepreneurs that are coming along. Um, because I think it's really important for other young people to see that only you know, people that are only a couple of years older than them actually did this, and so they can do it too. Um, so I mean, I would say it's as much you know, people with experience's responsibility to help mentor the young as it is for us, the young, to go and say to our peers, yeah, you can. Who else has uh, a, an important mentor in your, in your early lives? Well, I, I know that it's, it, it's easy, very easy for me to say that I wouldn't be where I am today without extensive mentorship. And it was a huge, hugely important. Uh, when I actually got to college, I went to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I actually wasn't even interested uh, in, to, to do research. I, it, was, it actually wasn't even on my radar. And I was in this program called the Meyerhoff Program, which serves to mentor people and, and specifically, specifically to get PhDs and to do research. And I ended up in the program and I said, okay, let me give it a shot. And I gave it a shot and I ended up loving it. And a big part of that was because my research mentor in college was very empowering. And like Adina said, just provided and just exposed me and just, just showed me like what was possible. Like, you know, what is actually possible, you know? 
at, at that young age and gave me all this responsibility. And I failed many, many times, but the encouragement uh, from him, and you just in, he said just to keep going. And years later, I'm, I'm hooked on research and I love it. And uh, you know, now I'm uh, pursuing an MD, PhD in the research that I'm doing. Uh, also couldn't have been possible without my fantastic research mentors because you're dealing with very difficult problems and you need someone there, or at least I needed someone to encourage me through the process. I would completely echo that. I certainly uh, would not be here were it not for the advice and guidance and mentorship of a great many people. Um, the one that really sticks out in my mind is uh, the PI of the lab that I worked in at Duke, uh, Dr. Kelly. Now, when I joined the lab, I was actually significantly less optimistic than I am now. I thought Fordoma was this rare disease that affects about 300 people in the United States. Who's going to be interested in Cordoma? Certainly companies aren't going to take an interest in it. Um, but Dr. Kelly, not only did he you know, spend the time teaching me the fundamentals of genetics and molecular biology and stay in the lab with me until 8 or 9 o'clock at night, but really gave me a sense of optimism, showed me examples of where uh, through understanding the molecular mechanisms that underlie uh, various rare cancers that we've been able to actually develop very effective and in some cases lucrative therapies. Um, so he pointed to an example, uh, a tumor that's equally rare uh, to chordoma, a very rare sarcoma called dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. And by understanding the molecular mechanisms that underlie that disease, uh, there's actually been a, a very effective therapy that's been developed and applied. And I think Dr. Kelly's you know, wisdom and encouragement has, has really borne out. Um, you know, fast forward six years, we just had our fourth international Cordoma research workshop. We had about 100 researchers from all over the world attend in Boston. And I think uh, one of the, the real telling aspects of the progress that's been made is there were actually six companies that participated, six pharmaceutical companies that participated uh, in this meeting because they view Cordoma as a potential orphan indication uh, for drugs that they might have in their pipeline. We have developed uh, a series of well-characterized and uh, easily accessible model systems. We've learned a lot about the biology of the disease. We have assembled a very motivated and, and organized research community uh, and an organized and motivated patient community. And I think the combination of those things really makes Cordoma uh, a great opportunity. And so I think you know, were it not for Dr. Kelly's uh, foresight and encouragement, I, I certainly don't think we would have uh, set, set upon the path that's ultimately gotten us where we are. And Laura, mentor. Oh boy, okay. Um, well, thank you so much for asking that question. It's actually, it's an extraordinarily important thing to emphasize, and because I'm not sure if the people in this room know what change you can make in someone's life, but um, I can tell you the woman who let me into her lab when I was 12, Cynthia Kenya at UCSF. Tell the, tell the story about how it was that you, you grew up in New Zealand? Yes. And this lab was in California? Yes. <laughs> and so tell everyone how it came to be that you moved from New Zealand to California. Right. So. Um, I had been reading about aging research for about four years, and there was this article, and I think it was in the Scientific American, that was talking about this extraordinary woman who was changing the way we were thinking about aging and making worms live twice as long as normal. And so I was 12, and I was just like, I don't know how this is going to work, but I have to meet this woman. Um, and so actually the first email I ever sent was to Cynthia.Kenyon at UCSF.edu or whatever it was. And and she wrote back. Um, and that changed my life. And, and so she wrote back, and then I went to go see her lab. And she, she showed me all of her lab and took time out of her day to show me. And at the end of the lab visit, I was like, I don't care what I have to do to make this work, but I want to come work here right now, because this is, this is like heaven to me. Um, and so she let this 12-year-old kid from New Zealand move to America and come and start working in her lab. So you basically convinced your parents, you convinced your parents to move you from, move the whole family from New Zealand to California so this 12 year old could save the world, right? They, they put up with a lot over the years. Um, Are they aging? They, well, I think that might have been part of it. My dad is like 60 something now. Um, no, but, but the important thing is, um, I will never forget what Cynthia did, and she changed the entire course of my life. And any one of you can do that. 
Um, and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be EPI. You can have a company, let someone come start working in the research part of your company. You can find some aspect of what you do that you can help to teach a young person. But it really does make a difference, and, and you can change a life. And so please, uh, please uh, do remember that. And, and I, would, I would add to that. I, I would add to that the younger the better. Um, because what I've seen, what I've seen, especially as we've mentored, you know, students, um, the freshmen often come up with some of the most innovative ideas, even if you have like freshmen and MBAs in the same course. Um, and I think it's just because we haven't been told no enough yet, and so we don't know what's not possible. So the younger the better. So let's talk about challenges. Um, what for many of you, what, what are you finding the most difficult to overcome in your various career paths here? I'm guessing they have found nothing challenging. They're so smart, it just all happens, right? Okay. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a lot of different things. I mean, certainly there's a, a constant need for funding. Uh, we've got about $3 million of very clearly defined projects that are teed up and ready to go, shovel ready, if you will. And you know, we're constantly looking for uh, individuals and companies that are interested in partnering with us to make those projects possible. But I'd actually say that the biggest challenge is a scientific one. Uh, over the last several years, there's actually been a really compelling case that's been developed uh, indicating that there's a particular gene called brachyuri uh, that plays a really central role in the development and, and pathogenesis of chordoma, and also in other cancers as well, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer. Disease comes back, right? You, that's, that's you've exactly got a possibility right. of facing this again. That's exactly right. I mean, so for me, I, I feel it every day. I feel the clock ticking. Um, so there's there's the, the urgency there. Now, so so we think that this this gene brachyuri uh, is a sensible target for chordoma. There's a, a lot of evidence pointing in that direction. The challenge, though, is that this gene is a transcription factor. And in speaking with people in the industry and with a lot of different researchers, there seems to be this dogma that says transcription factors are undruggable. Um, and I guess I, I'm a believer that where there's a will, there's a way. And so, you know, whether it be by uh, disrupting a, an interaction with a cofactor or, or something upstream, I think that, you know, we can solve this problem. And so I guess if, if I had an ask to make to you know, people in this audience, it would be, you know, let's think through how we, we target genes that people say are undruggable, how we actually develop a therapy uh, that, that targets this transcription factor. Um, you know, because if we could overcome that hurdle, you know, we, we can demonstrate that if we knock down brachyuri and chordoma uh, cell lines, it basically completely stops the growth of the cells. So we think that it's a really promising target, and now that we need to kind of do the, the tough science to develop a therapy against it. Who else? What are your, what are your challenges? Uh, well, one thing that, you know, that I encounter and I at least see um, out in the public is how, you know, the question becomes how do we engage the public in remaining interested in what we're doing? And I think there's a lot of cases where there's immediate support for the research. You know, everybody, a lot of people are on board with research to detect cancer earlier. But, you know, there's a lot of common sense things that we know about right now that is difficult to implement. And the example that pops out at me is the, you know, the idea of vaccination. And, you know, there's misinformation out there and it's hard for, you know, the lay person to distinguish the, you know, good and bad sources of scientific information. And, you know, there's been a, a great example um, in Australia where, you know, there hasn't been this uh, back and forth about the importance of vaccination and the government uh, recently uh, signed in uh, national funding to get everyone vaccinated with uh, an HPV vaccine, Gardasil. And, you know, now we're seeing, now we, we haven't, the program hasn't been in place long enough to assess its impact on cancer mortality, but, you know, there's some very interesting measures uh, that, are, that we can see already, and it, is in agree, it, it agrees with the, the, the models, so to speak, that have been generated. So, 
one, I, I think one challenge, and it, it's also a great opportunity, is how, how best to engage the public and keep them interested and show them you know, why what we're doing is important. Dina, Laura? I mean, there's so many different challenges and there's a lot of different ways to interpret that question. I mean, I think as an industry, one of the biggest ones that we face is the funding question, especially early stage stuff. Um, getting it's seed funding. Most of, people in this room, most of the people in this room would heartily agree with, with you. On well, that. I mean, the seed funding side of things is definitely challenging, is what I found. Um, because, and, and maybe that's different in like different locations in the country, but I mean, specifically in Seattle, we know that we have issues with seed funding. And so, you know, you have to fly down to San Francisco in order to even get access to a lot of it. Um, so, I mean, I would say that that's definitely an issue, and I know that that's also an issue just in the research side of things as well. Um, it's pretty hard to get funding for ideas that are, you know, under $50,000, let's say. Um, and so I know that there are startups that are actually addressing specifically that using crowdfunding to be able to fund those smaller projects. But I mean, I think those small projects are the things that lead to big innovations later. And so making sure there's an ecosystem that's supporting that is really, really important. Um, I don't know if we can do anything on the regulatory side of things to help that, but I know that there's innovations taking place in the crowdfunding side of things that's, I think, going to fill that gap because there's not been anything filling it so far. But you are. Yeah, I, actually, exactly on that point, I think one major problem that especially, and it's really sad that biology has this problem when the reason, one of the reasons I think the computer industry got so huge was you had all these kids in their garages and in their basements and they were tinkering with stuff and with like, you know, 10 bucks and a trip to the local hardware store, they could get enough kit supplies to start making things and that could turn into something useful in a very short period of time with a very little amount of capital. And in biotech, my God, I mean, how much funding you need to get started to, to prove out you know, what could be a very interesting idea, to put that into practice, to get a lab and access to labs, and then the biosafety clearance to actually work in those labs, which was a problem when you're 12 and the minimum age is 14, um, is, is actually a huge problem. Um, and, so, and, and so that's problem number one. Problem number two is maybe even more, um, more of a constraint than funding, um, because funding, you. You can, money is out there and it's fluid, but, but information is very valuable, especially in biotech. Information about how to do things, how to run a business, what businesses look like inside, um, existing networks that are social. All these things um, are valuable tools in the toolkit of successful biotech business person. And when you start out, especially when you're abnormally young, it's very difficult to get a grasp on those. And to give you just one example, and then I'll just let you guys uh, take forth the, the problem statement. Um, when I started trying to build a venture capital fund, the first question was, well, actually, how do you do that? Like, what do you need legally? What do you need in terms of structure? What is an LP? Um, and I went and I asked like 50 people these questions, and all the VCs gave me different answers. And it turns out that most of them didn't actually know how to like structurally what a venture capital fund looked like, because someone else had set them up, right? It, like so much um, opaqueness in terms of information led to having to like construct the entire process from scratch and build a toolkit for how to build a venture capital fund. And it's it was incredible to me that this information wasn't actually out there you know, in, in the brain of someone that we could just ask. And so, um, and there isn't a mentorship, something you can do to help young people just tell them how things work um, in a very practical sense. So, um, obviously the common denominator for us being with you today is your age. So to what extent is your age, and when is it an advantage? When is it a disadvantage? When, when do, um, uh, do you think doors uh, more often to open for you because of your age or, or, or close or some of each? What have your experiences been? Are you taking as seriously as you think you should? Are you giving credit you don't deserve? I would say it's both. I mean, you know, your assets are your liabilities. Your liabilities are your assets. I would say that earlier on, it was definitely more challenging, but I think that that was because I had my own stuff around being young. You know, am I too young to be the CEO? I found that once I dealt with my own stuff and moved that out of the way, then it stopped becoming an issue. Um, but I would say that that's probably 
kind of the challenge that everybody goes through in whatever they're doing. It's, it's the most work that I think that we do is on our own selves and understanding our own stuff so we can get that out of our, our way and actually do our jobs. Um, so I mean, I think that it depends on how much of it is an issue for you um, to you know, how much it affects your ability to get things done. Wise words. Well, I, I'm pursuing both my MD and my PhD, and it's interesting how... You're not even that young, you're 29. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm relatively old here, yeah. Um, but it's, it's interesting the, uh, the viewpoint that people have in medicine versus you know, biomedical research. Uh, you know, medicine is like an older type of, you know, there's a lot of hierarchy and, you know, new ideas, if, you know, the importance of those, uh, you know, is shaped by who is actually, you know, uh, sharing the viewpoint. So, you know, younger people have less of a say. And, you know, you, con you, you contrast that in the research world where, you know, I'm speaking in generalizations here, but, you know, fresh, young insights are highly regarded and you know the older faculty that you know are you know you know running their labs they really appreciate the the insight that you know young people can contribute so it's it's been interesting for me to see that you know two sides of the same point interesting josh Laura? No, I think probably on the whole it's been an asset. I mean, certainly being the uh, most unqualified and most uneducated person in a room uh, makes it easy to ask questions that uh, one might not be able to ask otherwise. Um, but uh, you know, and also I think to Adina's point, you, know, you don't necessarily know uh, what's not possible. Um, and you know, I think when, when you are young, especially you know, earlier on, uh, people, I think, you know, gave you a lot more uh, leeway and there was a lot more understanding, you know, if you proposed something that sounded, you know, perhaps outlandish or, uh, you know, that, that maybe went, went against dogma. Um, but, you know, I, I think to the extent that you, know, you, you can make yourself uh, credible through, you know, the, you know your, your understanding of a concept, uh, I think, you know, what I found is that you know, I've certainly been able to uh, overcome, uh, you know, any sort of, um, bias or disadvantage that, you know, that, that age might pose? Um, I think Adina's point is very sound. Um, when you accept yourself, things become much easier and people see that and I think recognize it. One other thing that's nice about being young is I think you have very little fear. Um, especially if there's something that you care so much about um, and, and you just need to see this vision through. If you have that and, and you're young and you don't have anything that ties you to a place or to a career, um, you can just go for it. And I've seen so many instances of people my age trying things that shouldn't work and having them you know, fail 50 times, but then work that 51st time, that makes all the difference. And so I think you know, while being young does have a lot of disadvantages in terms of experience, people skills, there are a lot of things that we know we don't know and that we are very actively working to learn. Um, you do have that advantage of being able to try it at 50 times so you can get to the 51st time. So we are celebrating our 20th convention here. Um, and it occurs to me to ask you, where do you, where do you, what can you, how far out can you see? Can you imagine 20 years from now uh, and where you would like what you're currently endeavoring to, to accomplish to be? Where do you, where do you want to be? Where does the, where do you want the field that you're in to be 20 years from now? Can you see that far? Indubitably. Uh in 20 years, the goal is to have the first health span extending therapeutic on market. And what that means is one therapeutic that extends the possible maximum lifespan of us. Um, and I firmly believe it is possible to get one of those past to phase three uh, within the 20 year time frame, given what I've seen so far in preclinical research and a cogent line of reasoning from that. I think you, you said that you, you think we ought to be able to bioengineer ourselves to the next therapy. Isn't that right? That's actually the long-term plan. 
Um, I'm not sure I feel about immortality. I don't know that talking about things like what if everyone lives forever and the world became just full of people are useful right now. What I do know is if we can budge that limit, if we can break what is currently a constraint on the amount of seconds that we have on this earth, then we have a shot. Then we have the chance to, to do that again, to do that serially, to start improving and iterating um, more and more quickly and eventually get to the point where you could imagine practically living an unbounded or uncut off amount of time where currently we just can't even imagine that. 20 years hence. Well, you know, one, one thing that's exciting to me um, is the idea that a lot of disease is preventable. And we know what causes disease. And, you know, and these, disease tend, these diseases tend to be very expensive to treat uh, when they're caught at a late stage. But you know, especially in this type of forum where you know, we're focused on biotechnology. I mean, there's huge opportunities for biotechnology. Uh, you know, in, in, in when people think about uh, you know this term called mobile health and you know digital health. You know, people wearing devices that track what's going on in their body, and you know, predicting when you know something's off. You know, maybe you should go talk to a physician now. You know, this is you know this is uh, something's off here. And to me, that, that's just really exciting because not only, are, you know, not only will people be healthier, uh, but healthcare will be cheaper as well. And you know, I think that's a huge opportunity. And that's, that's where I hope to, to see myself you know, in, in the coming decades. And it gets very much within reach as well. 20 years. 20 years. I think as an industry, we can make some generalizations like quantize self and potentially living forever. Um, but I think if you, if you narrow in on bioinformatics specifically, which is my industry, I think it's really, really hard to predict. I mean, we're already doing things that three years ago people didn't think would be possible or even, you know, or, or cost effective. I mean, three years ago it was $100,000 worth of just raw chemistry to just do the sequencing for one human, and now we're down to $3,000. You know, three years ago, it was like 30 days to just get the raw data, and now we're down to 24-hour turnaround time. Um, so I, I think it's really hard to say where bioinformatics will fit into that in the 20-year time frame. I can tell you that it's going to involve big data, um, just because the amount of data and the pace of data production is increasing. I mean, I think it's tripling like every single year. Um, and so that combined with quantized self data um, will, will lead to some really, really interesting innovations, but I don't think that we can predict that. I think you told me your, your technology is something like 40 times faster or more capable than your competitors, is that? Yeah, yeah, we can analyze a whole human genome from like the raw data that comes off a sequencer down to a list of annotated variants in three hours, um, which to my knowledge is the fastest on the planet. If that's not true, tell me so I stop saying that in public. Um, but I mean, we're going to, I, I, it's very, very easy for me to say that, you know, in the 10 year time frame, we're going to be able to essentially do instant Diagnostic, you're going to be able to just read out everything very, very quickly. So, I mean, 20 years out, I don't know. I don't know. Josh, I guess 20 years from now you'd like to be around. That's exactly right. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful that in 20 years we will have cured Cordoma, and I'm, I'm confident that we will. Uh, in the meantime, though, there are a lot of other rare cancers that are facing similar challenges that don't have uh, a champion to necessarily push them forward. And I think that there's an opportunity actually for all of the rare cancers to benefit uh, from economies of scale and joining forces and creating a shared infrastructure that we could all benefit from. I think the reality is as, we, as our understanding of cancer becomes more sophisticated, 
um, you know, every patient is going to get uh, classified into rarer and rarer subtypes, and, and the reality is each of those subtypes is its own rare cancer. And so I think as an industry, we're going to have to figure out ways that we can effectively and, and viably develop drugs for smaller and smaller populations of cancer patients. And I think we're seeing in a lot of rare diseases that uh, patient advocacy organizations, medical research foundations, are playing a very big role in facilitating that process. And, um, and so I, I think that uh, while uh, some foundations have reached a level of scale that has been quite effective, very few of us in the rare cancer space have reached that level of scale, and I think there's an opportunity uh, for perhaps some consolidation for, uh, for joining forces and, and solving problems uh, on a large scale rather than you know, one disease at a time. Each one of you um, is really focused in an area of personalized medicine. I think you're, you're in, in virtually every case, you're talking about the genotypical characteristics of the patient, isolating them, and, and uh, so just give us your thoughts on personalized medicine, what you think the um, where you see that going, what you think the limits of that might be. It's actually extraordinary. So backstage, I hadn't known what Adina's company did exactly before coming here, but we'd been spending the past six months looking into this space, trying to see how NGS would play into the downstream analysis and trying to get a feel for what the market would look like, whether you would have data going to a cloud and then taken and analyzed by third-party um, services or whether um, you would have still multiple platforms, no one leader, and all of them competing, but one or, or two great bioinformatics companies able to go across platforms. And that question is one that we're thinking about very hard right now. But what I think is exciting is none of us had known, I think, what each other did before we came here. But we all got into this conversation of, oh, you thinking about NGS too? Yeah, well, that's what we've been thinking or pondering about for the past seven months. Oh, you built a company around that. It's pretty cool. And then um, seeing you work on the sequencing part of it and seeing that collaboration of interests. Well, one thing that I'm personally excited about, I mean, I spend a lot of my days you know, researching cancer, uh, is the fact that you know we are we're understanding cancer at, at at very high resolution, and you know we don't have that many. So one one side that we're working on is you know how do you detect cancer at an earlier stage, but inevitably you know there's going to be some cancers that you don't catch, and that's why it's incredibly important to keep looking into how do we best treat cancers. And if there's one thing that, one of the most encouraging things that's come about is that there's a, you know, there's a lot of different types of mutations that cancer can have, but they generally fall into roughly a dozen key pathways. So, you know, you can think that, you know, you can drug, some, some, some mutations are druggable, and some are not. And, and actually, most of the changes that occur are very difficult to design an inhibitor or some type of compound to modulate. But if you think in terms of what are the pathways and you sequence an, an individual patient's tumor and you find what are the key pathways that are altered, you can actually just, you can affect, you know, different, um, you, you can affect different parts of a pathway that actually has a drug, druggable target. So as we get more and more data and as we study more and more of these tumors, we're going to be able to precisely treat each person's tumor in the, in the most optimal way. And I, I think that's very exciting. Yeah. Personalized medicine, everybody has their genome sequence as part of your medical record. All drugs are developed for specific genetic populations. It's definitely going to happen. I think that it's probably in like the 10-year horizon or so. Um, I think that we have a lot of challenges in order to get there first, though. I, I would say that specifically accuracy spe around, around sequences is going to be a big issue. Um, because right now, there's a lot of error in just you know, the chemistry of it all. And then the bioinformatics tools that we have, I mean, they miss a huge percentage of genetic variations. I mean, there was a Beijing Genome Institute paper that was put out like two years ago. And they did 
a really, really interesting study to look at how much genetic variation really was out there. Um, and they used some really, really different techniques from what we're using you know, as an industry generally. And we're missing like 30, 50% of human variation because they're just more complex than the current analysis tools can pick up. So I think that you know, in order to get to you know, this dream of personalized medicine, we really have to solve the accuracy issues and, and make tools that are actually going to enable this to happen. Um, but I believe that it will happen. But we've got some things to, we got we got to work on. Well, I really see the let's say the march towards t personalized medicine as uh, you know, a, a two-track approach. I mean, the uh, tools that we have at our disposal, the, the tools in our tool chest, are, are growing and expanding. Uh, by that, I mean drugs to treat patients. But now, increasingly, I think the challenge is, as Isaac was saying, matching the right drug with the right patient. Um, and you know, I don't, uh, certainly we're in the early days, but just in the last year or so, I think we've noticed in, you know, in this one rare cancer that there's really been a major shift in mindset uh, that has trickled down, not only from academic medical centers, but, you know, to patients across the country. It, it, people's first instinct now is to get their tumor sequenced, so to get their tumor profiled, and they're demanding, they're asking their oncologist uh, to treat accordingly. In fact, in many cases, the patients are ahead of their oncologist. Uh, so we get requests or, or inquiries on at least a weekly basis, if not um, more commonly, about where to get my tumor sequence, what's the appropriate profiling to get, and then based on that, how to guide therapy. Uh, I think that's the kind of the, the, the question that remains to be answered. We can certainly generate a list of so-called actionable mutations, but I don't think that there's long-term data to suggest that actually treating based on these mutation profiles actually makes a substantial difference in outcome. I think that's kind of the, the, the key test or the key hurdle that needs to be overcome. But I'm you know, confident that in the next couple of years we're going to get that information. Well, we've looked back on the, the past 20 years of this convention and, and this industry, um, uh, how far we've come. Uh, we've talked a little bit, at least I talked a little bit, about the frustrations that we confront every day in, in, in our businesses. Um, but I think we've accomplished what, what I wanted to accomplish here was as we look out over the next 20 years and think about where we will be, uh, knowing that uh, we have in this country these four uh, brilliant young people as well as many of their peers, I think gives us a tremendous reason to be hopeful about the future of biotechnology, the future of healthcare in America, and the future of the country. So thank you for being with us.